the current procedure, you can kind of see in here, the surgeon rests his forearms on the forehead of the patient, and he basically has to anticipate any involuntary movement by the patient. Um, a large percentage of patients have been shown to snore or, or jerk their head while anesthetized. Now, while Dr. Abbott's um, robotic arms that perform the, the surgery do address the problem of natural tremor in the hand and uh, human shortcomings, they do not help to anticipate movement of the patient. So our goal is to design an apparatus that rigidly fixes to the skull and provides a mounting place for the robotic arms. So if and when the patient does move, the robotic arms will move with the head and there'll be no displacement between the tool and the eye. Our primary goals, we want to, we want to uh, ensure uh, that we remain within a tolerance on the order of hundreds of microns as far as displacement between the tool and the eye during movement. We want it to be compatible with two robotic arms so that uh, it, you, would need a, you would need two robotic arms to take advantage of this technology. We also want to be able to uh, fit this device to three standard deviations above the nominal circumference of a male head down to three standard deviations below the circumference of a female head. What is an effective, effective granular jam? I'm about to explain that. I, mean, I know what granular jam is. Oh, cool. Well, that. that is probably a buzzword. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, secondary goals. It would be nice to have a design that you can use for either the left or right eye, instead of having to have one helmet for a right eye, one helmet for a left eye. It would also be nice to have one helmet that would adjust to three sigma above and three sigma below our nominal circumferences. Um, potential benefits of this, we could increase the current efficacy of certain procedures, and we could possibly introduce stem cell uh, injection. So the main mechanism by which we propose this design to work is granular jamming. The most common example of granular jamming most people see is vacuum-packed coffee. Um, you remove air from the package and it becomes a fixed, rigid object. This is great, they're using this in robotic arms now. Um, basically you have a rubber, like it shows in the picture, you have a rubber balloon full of coffee grains. You remove the air and it, all the grains lock in place and you have a rigid body. This is great for trying to pick up things as opposed to a little robotic uh, claw. It's great because anytime you take your balloon, you put it over some object, remove the air, it conforms perfectly to the geometry I've set out. So how do we implement this in our design? So we make a skull cap out of a balloon filled with coffee grounds. We put a port on the back that runs to a pump. We create a vacuum and it conforms to the geometry of the head. We then attach a shell over the top to provide a mounting place for the robotic arm. So, current uh, design progress, our, our current design does have a mountable spot for two robotic arms, and then you can see there's some slots along the side here. This is so that we can take the underlying uh, skull cap, protrude some of it through, so that when we pull the air from the skull cap, it will fix in place rigidly, and that's the mechanism by which we want to rigidly attach the skull cap to the shell. So, effectively, we've 
fix the shell to the skull cap and then the skull cap to the head, which should ensure that the tools remain um, in place relative to the eye. Our first iteration, we want to 3D print so that we can test specifically that function first. Um, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to spend thousands of dollars in, in, um, on metal materials and uh, costly manufacturing procedures when we could spend hundreds of dollars on a plastic uh, 3D printed model that we can still test for our, fun our critical functions. Next thing we want to talk about is the custom design of the Brandinger jamming pots. So essentially the skull cap that Ryan mentioned. And the main things that we, the main reason why we want to design a custom made one is because we want to prevent the motion as much as possible of the robot in relation to the eye. So one of the specifications that we have been given by Dr. Abbott is that through the microscope used in surgery, he wants to see no visible motion. Um, and Ryan mentioned that this is like hundreds of microns. Yeah. So it's a pretty tall order. However, he is happy currently if we continue to work, uh, continue to develop the ideas that have improvement each iteration. So that's what we have been doing up to this point. Um, the reason why we decided to do a custom made pod is to maximize the contact area between the skull and the pod and also between the pod and the shell. So we want to use these unique head geometries that each person has and once the granular jamming is packed then we, won't, we will have a rigid shell essentially. And then we also talk about the slots and that's the locking mechanism that we're going to have in between the shell and the pod. And going back to these pictures, we can see the locking mechanism on this first picture. The second picture shows the mold for the granular jamming pod and in 3D. And then we have to cut that to make it flat so that we could dip that in, dipping la in liquid latex and then create our balloon from that. So the current testing that we have done and are doing is testing the head acceleration during snoring and breathing. And the reason for that is, is that, as Ryan mentioned, one of the biggest challenges is, is when a patient moves. And because he's, he has robotic arms on his head, inertial forces will want to move it once the head accelerates. So we want to prevent that as much as possible. And so we decided to emulate breathing and snoring with a accelerometer placed on top of our head and gathering the data from that. And we figured out that the maximum acceleration during the snoring was 1.4 Gs. And we kind of benchmarked it against sneezing, which was 4 Gs. And we found that in uh, through other sources. And so the inertial forces that connected with that is 11. Point two newtons. And this is what we've been testing all of our prototypes at, which is about one kilogram of force, a little over that. We have tested up to 1.5 kilograms. And 11.2 is corresponds to 1.4 G? No, one, uh, it's, it corresponds to the inertial force. That's the inertial forces attached to that that you would experience with the robot of that weight. Oh, that's that's actually the weight of the robot. Yeah. So like, it added the, sorry, good. Well, so what it is, is the weight of a robot is about 7.85 meters. So if you were then to take that and then the head, and jerk the head at that benchmark about 1.5 Gs, it would okay, be, that's what I was getting at. Did you multiply the inertia times 1.4 times 4? Yeah, exactly. Okay. And so that's what we've been testing like forces at. We have, we've used a force spring scale and tested against that. Um, more accurate data will be gathered over the summer with um, test subjects going undergoing surgery. Um, so this is going to be an ongoing project for the next couple of years. This 
These are the two configurations that we did vexillarometer data in here. The first one, you can see that the vexillarometer is on the top of the head, the second one is on the side. And here are the plots associated with each. And we can see the, so this portion right here where it's stay stationary, that's when we're just breathing, and the spikes are due to the snoring emulations that we have. Though, um, the reason why there is uh, it's not the same magnitudes, is because it's hard to replicate what you do when you snore, uh, especially when you're fake snoring. So here are milestones. It's important to note that we revised a lot of the starting dates because we wanted to research further what kind of clay we wanted to use for the mold and if we wanted to do a destructible mold so that we could more easily pull out um, the balloon from inside, from outside of the mold. And also we wanted to make sure that the dipping latex that we were using would give us the right properties that we needed. So that caused us to have to push back um, a lot of the tasks that were in series with those. And, but we're still confident that we'll be able to um, finish the testing by tomorrow, which is when we're hoping to do that. And the custom shade, uh, show, the custom molds are drying, and that's what has caused it to slip if you look at it this way. So, and then we'll be able, be able to make the custom balloons once that is completely dry, which seems like today is looking good. And for the next for the next portion of the semester, everything seems to be on track. We haven't seen any changes that we need to make due to the setbacks that we have thus far. This is our current budget. The most expenses, most um, I guess important expenses are the custom shaped uh, custom shells that we're going to make. Um, the three D printing of it is not necessarily cheap. However, um, we are expecting funding to come in further into the semester. It's been secured, but it has not arrived, and we don't know when it will. So that's what we're waiting for. So we're being cautious currently, knowing that we'll be able to use some of that money for long. Are there any questions? Um, so let me make sure I understand. Yeah. So you said your, your test condition is to apply 11, uh, I mean, or, uh, 11 newtons, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe you said this and I missed it. You're applying 11 newtons to the head and then observing what? We're swift. Yeah. How? Um, the, the original idea was to use an optical tracker. So you would use because oh, so you haven't done this yet, but you're going to do it. Yeah, we, okay, okay, we've done preliminary tests, and those have been a little bit different. Where we just measure it, right? How much? Okay. Goes. So how are you? So okay, sorry. So go ahead. Are, are you going to do your measurements under the microscope then, or do you have an intermediate test? The intermediate test would be the optical tracker because okay. uh, the microscope can. Uh, I think the optical tracker is on the order of millimeters, and the microscope is greater than that. So the optical tracker, we would put uh, a bike lock because this whole top half of the skull uh -huh. is all one piece. So if you put a bike lock, there shouldn't be any movement between, say, a uh, probe on the helmet and the teeth. Okay. And, you, and, you, and you observe that. So that's one test. And you're also going to do it under the microscope. Mm -hmm. OK. And what's, um, and show me exactly where are you going how is the load uh, applied to the head? So the load would be applied, um, basically you could you put on a bike block with a probe and you uh, have a force, a force gauge, a force scale. And we, I would design an helmet basically with a rung through it so we could just attach it there and pull either along this way or along this way. Okay, so you have a person there and you're going to pull on the helmet this way or that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and so as you're, you're going to load it up. <coughs> okay. 
uh, and then observe any the, the, the elements. Wait a second. I'm trying to figure out what's fixed here. Um, so the so the the probe and the teeth. It really doesn't matter. I don't think how the head moves because all you're trying to find out is what is the deviation between this point and this point. Okay, so nothing's fixed. You've got the two points, you pull on the helmet, and you're just looking at the deviation between those points. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I got you. Because that's what okay. the, well, we were most being wondering about so much deviation between points. Right. And what's the resolution of your measure? Yeah. So the optical tracker uh, is on the order of, I believe it's. Yeah. Yeah, it's like half a million. Okay. And the when you your spec is no visible motion under the microscope under this loading scenario. Yeah. Um, and do you know I had an estimate of what no visible motion under the microscope means uh, in terms of? We have not been able to find that yet. Okay. And the reason why um, Abbott decided to go with that specific specification is that... That's what really matters. Yeah, it's because if we don't see it, then it likely will not affect. But this further testing will need to be done on that to make sure that like, even if there is motion, that it won't damage the retina. Yeah, okay, that, that's why I know that you have, you have the goal that you're targeting. Yeah. When you're under the microscope, are you going to, how is, is the load going to be applied the same? Are you going to test this under the microscope, right? Yeah. So you can see that. Is the load going to be applied the same way? And you can still see both trackers under the microscope? You don't need the trackers under the microscope. For the microscope, you're going to have the tool, and then you're going to have a point on the eye. Essentially, someone's going to be yeah. wearing glasses with a point on it. Uh, and then you are going to see if you can see a deviation from where the tool started out to raise. In that case, then, the, oh, go ahead. Yes. So, uh, where will we test this? They actually have, like, they can take video of what the microscope sees. Yeah. So you can track on that video any motion we observe. Okay. And basically, it's just a matter of see what it can do. Go ahead. That was it. Okay. Um, So, how, okay, so here's my other question here. So, um, well, okay, one comment, because when you talked about, you guys came to talk about this, uh -huh. right, in my office, and one of the things I said that you'll need to make sure to do is have a really robust experimental plan so that you know that your results are, you know, you, you, you've got a range of head sizes that you're trying to do. Um, you need to make sure that you know, it's, that the performance is uh, consistent from one test to the next, all that kind of stuff. So you'll need that really robust test plan at some point. We'll want to see what that really, what that test plan looks like and how you're going to analyze the data from it. Um, the question I have is, what if you test it and you get too much motion? Like, what if it, what if you don't, what, because you don't have any predictive capability here, right? Yeah. So, um, what if it's like you test it out and there's too much motion? You can see the motion. Then what? I guess you could do you know, kind of a parametric study but when you start varying to see if it will have an effect on your output, right? Does your brain size have an effect? Yeah. Do different kinds of latex have an effect? Fix the latex is one of the things we're looking at. You mean it's with. different material for the shell itself? That's probably where I would go next. Yeah. Dr. Abbott, we talked to him, you know, what if this doesn't work? Yeah. Because that was one of the things that they asked us at the our state the last okay. semester. What if this doesn't work? Because we asked him and he, he just said, do what you can and get get the best that you can and um, he's just gonna continue on the project. So that's the question you say, do the what are you doing to be the best that you can, right? <laughs> so what's I mean um, because presumably, if you could do better or worse, there's a difference between the things that you're doing between worse and better. And what's that difference? 
Like, what does that what does that mean? Do better or do like? If you were to deliberately try not to do this, <laughs> what, what, what would that look like? What What would you do differently to not do this? I think I think as long I mean, as we're continually.